Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 46 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Today, we're joined by Nicole Robbins, who is a holistic nutritionist and the owner of Sprout Organic Market in Vancouver, BC. Nicole and I got together when I was on my recent tour in the US and Canada, and we talk all things organic. When I first started treating my SIBO, the last thing on my mind was eating organic produce. I was just trying to to get my head around this new and restricted diet. However, as I progressed and I became more aware of the types of foods that I put into my body, I became aware of the importance of organic produce, particularly with some ingredients that are often very heavily sprayed with pesticides and herbicides and, and all sorts of chemicals. And I started to switch my food to a more organic way of eating. So today, Nicole and I talk about how to go organic, what you should look for when you're choosing organic produce, and why organic produce can actually have a really great impact on the environment and what to do if you can't choose organic. So I hope you enjoy today's episode with Nicole Robbins. Hi, Nicole. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. It's exciting to have you in Vancouver. I know. Well, we're coming live from your gorgeous organic store in North Vancouver, and we've got some gorgeous people here with us today. So it's as part of the Very Healthy exciting. Gut Live recording um, as I tour around North America. So it's so great to actually see people in real life rather than be sitting in my office back in Melbourne <laughs> looking at a computer screen. <laughs> exactly. It's really exciting for us here too. Yeah. So let's start off by talking about how you got into running an organic business and why, like why that was so important to you. Absolutely. When I was pregnant with my first child, um, I'd already been eating organic for a few years, but I didn't really, other than understanding the pesticide risk, I never really made the connection that the old adage, you are what you eat, is a hundred percent. It's the only time we take the outside world into our bodies. So um, my son was born and when he was 16 months old, he had some severe allergies. Um, he had a massive reaction and we discovered that he was anaphylactic to um, nuts, uh, in particular cashews and pistachios. And so that sort of started me down the rabbit hole a bit on nutrition. And I went into nutrition school and became a re registered holistic nutritionist. At the same time, uh, a friend who owned a home delivery company here in Vancouver called Organics at Home was uh, selling his business. And my husband and I thought, well, this is it. Let's just go go in, all in. And uh, now we uh, evolved into a retail space five years ago, and there's no looking back. <laughs> and what a gorgeous retail space it is. Thank it's you. really nice to be standing in it. I always find stores like this so dangerous because I cannot walk out without spending a lot of money. No, so I look at the shelves, I'm like, oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and it's these places are really ideal for people like myself and, and those that are here with us today that have SIBO and other digestive complaints because yes. the food's natural right. and it doesn't contain all of the nasties, so it's not going to be as irritating to our gut as, That's say, right. the standard food you might find on a supermarket shelf. That's right. I try to go with the least processed foods possible. So for people like yourself and many, many other people that shop with us, you can get your essentials here, your whole foods, that you can make your own recipes without um, all the things that are a problem um, to your guts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about organic. There's so much confusion around what organic actually means. Yes. And I know with some brands that they can say they are organic, but they might only have like 70% organic materials right. in them. Or, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing where companies, where clever marketers, and having been a marketer for 20 years, <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for what some of my fellow colleagues have done in their right. careers. Um, so 
talk to us just around the basics of what organic means to start with. A hundred percent. So um, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of talk today about non-GMO um, or grown organically smaller farms, but um, to get certified organic foods means that these foods are grown without pesticides or herbicides. Um, by becoming certified organic, they cannot be GMO. So you don't need the non-GMO if you're buying certified organic foods. Um, the growing practices tend to be um, more uh, sustainable because of the lack of chemicals. They're very, very rigid testing. And um, to become certified organic, you have to really follow some really strict guidelines and they are inspected regularly. So, um, you know, in terms of getting certified, you have to be seven years prior to that. You have to be completely organic in terms of your growing practices. There can be no Roundup, no herbicides, um, and then you receive your certification. Yeah. And seven years is a long time. So I can imagine it also makes it quite difficult for small producers mm -hmm. um, or people that are starting to actually get off the ground to, to do that. It is, and that's why it's so, so important to support certified organic um, farms because the cost scale is tremendous. The more farms we can support um, as organic farms, the more organic farms there will be. And then hopefully one day we'll see that cost scale come down, but it is, a very difficult process to grow organically, uh, certified organic in particular. Yeah. Why should we be thinking about using more organic produce? Well, there's a, a few reasons why. Uh, number one would be the various pesticides they use are known cancer-causing agents, and our, our immune systems are constantly under assault just living in this world. When you factor in you know, all the other dietary issues and SIBU and all these other things, you, you have to reduce your toxic load. Um, our bodies are constantly struggling to maintain homostasis, which is balance. And uh, whenever we continue to throw toxins at it, it just, it makes it harder and harder for our bodies to maintain that. I know when I started going on this journey and, um, you know, you go into research mode, you go into research obsessive mode mm -hmm. <laughs> for many of us. And I started reading about just what was happening to our microbiome with the chemicals coming in on our foods. And I was actually really horrified that business is allowed to spray our plants and our vegetables and our crops yeah. with these incredibly toxic chemicals yeah. to keep the bugs and, you know, bacteria and everything away from the crops. But eating that. That's going straight right. into our bodies. And given that our bodies have more bacteria living in them than humans, yes. than human cells, I think we need to be very conscious of what's coming in our food. Absolutely. And I mean, we have up to, I think it's approximately five pounds of symbiotic bacteria that live on us and in us, and we need them. Uh, we need them desperately. So yes, you're absolutely right. When we're spraying and irradiating our foods and do and monocropping with the larger um, scale farms, it's depleting our soils and it's it's just this incredible negative cycle that is impacting every one of our our health statuses. So if we think about um, this, was another thing I must admit I had not thought about until I started doing research um, when I began my SIBO journey, but the impact on the soil. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk about, you know, why we need healthy soil to have healthy crops? Well, absolutely. Not as well as one of my farmers could, uh, but um, soil, soil depletion is becoming a major problem around the world. Um, but we, nutrients in your food comes from the soil. So when we're monocropping or we're um, spraying it with toxins, um, we're killing all the good microbes in it and we're depleting the nutrients. So the food we're eating is becoming less nutritious. And then we need to constantly be adding back in. And we just, there's no need for that necessarily, but um, absolutely soil depletion is a major problem and we need to start looking at protecting our soil. And the smaller scale farms and certified organic and biodynamic farms do that. So we need more of them. And I think um, biodynamic can actually be, a, if you cannot find a, a good um, 
organic option, yes. looking for biodynamic can also be a good option. Can you Bio- talk about what mm-hmm. biodynamic actually is? Absolutely. We have a biodynamic farm that we deal with in Oliver. It's uh, JMJ Farms. It's Martin Rote. And actually, it was started by his mother and father years ago. Um, biodynamic farming is a bit out there for a lot of us. We do have some biodynamic vineyards in BC as well. But biodynamic talks about um, creating more of a, an ecosystem within the farm. Um, they formulate special herbal composts. Um, they don't like to call it fertilizers, but for, for the rest of us, we can think of it as like a compost creation, but it's done um, energetically. Uh, they plant with the phases of the moon. They also harvest with the phases of the moon. We don't think of plants as um, beings, but you know they to get the most nutritious plant or produce, you have to treat it with this care that they do. So, um, for example, um, greenhouses like the hot houses. They stress the plants so much because they'll have 24 hours of light on them. And and the plants can't handle that. And so they become less nutritious. You can taste it. So with biodynamic farming, they really work with this herbal formulation and, um, and their whole uh, planting and harvesting cycle. And truly, there have been nutrition tests done on a lot of Martin's produce. He's got award-winning apples and apricots and wonderful things, but the nutritional testing on biodynamic food, it's its quite remarkable. And biodynamic farming is not very big in North America, but it's quite huge in Europe, especially Germany and Austria. Is it big in Australia? Uh, it's growing. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, I would say it's still relatively in its infancy, yeah. but it's a growing area. People are becoming more aware and it really is a step above organic. It's, it's better. It's a better choice. I went to, I had the pleasure of visiting a pig farm um, mm-hmm. in Australia. It's on the border of Victoria and New South Wales, just mm-hmm. on the Murray River. And uh, my partner, bless him, um, saw that they had a festival one weekend and you could come and stay on their property, literally camp with the pigs mm-hmm. and, um, and learn how to butcher a whole carcass. So it was amazing looking at, you know, the love and care that they yeah. take with their animals. And they're a fully biodynamic farm. So, you know, we got to see how they did their operations, but then we also got to taste both the pork and the other produce that they grow. Oh my God. It was the most the delicious, yeah. like it was like someone had you know, made this food on steroids. It was so much better tasting. Better. And the pork, you know, she was, you know, she would season it at, with some products, but her thing was salt and pepper is really all we need to mm. bring out the natural flavor. You know, yeah. the flavors are so good. Yeah. And, uh, and it really was incredible. And these pigs were happy pigs. It was so nice to see them roaming yeah. these big paddocks and having the best piggy life. It's true. And for, you know, for those of us who are sort of new to this, when we talk about like energetics, you really, you can taste the happiness in the food. And I know that's hard for vegetarians and vegans to hear, but these are happy animals that live a good life. And that is the best way to eat because it is more in harmony and better for our bodies and therefore more nutritious. I think that we often as we evolve and as we, particularly when we're dealing with chronic illness, like something like Mm. SIBO, that we start to realise, we start to look outside of ourselves and we look at the planet and the growing practices of the food we're eating and we realise that it is all connected. Everything is interconnected. And yet Mm. for many people, myself included over the years, you just think, oh, well, it's just a plant or it's just a nut or seed or it's just an animal. You forget that it's all cyclical and... Mm everything works off, you know, the seasons and the moon and, you know, Mm -hmm. the water and and all the rest. And I think that by going back to a more sustainable method of farming, it makes sense in terms of how nature would do it. Absolutely. And there's a huge movement um, within North America, particularly in Vancouver, about eating locally, sourcing locally. And that sort of pushes us to eating seasonally. Um, You know, there was a time where and it was a wonderful time when you know they started being able to ship food from far away so that you could have strawberries on your table 
in December and and you know wow that was pretty amazing but should we um, you know is that what our bodies need when we're in the winter here in North America um, you know we need more grounding and sustaining foods we need to be able to warm ourselves so you need more bone broths and stews and soups you know eating a raw diet in the winter can really have some adverse health effects so yeah it, it, the move to the local has been great in terms of keeping us eating seasonally I've become really passionate about supporting local suppliers and producers. I would much rather put my hard-earned money into a local business of someone who deserves my hard-earned money than the big supermarket chains. Right. And I find these days that I go in so rarely into a supermarket. Um, yes, I pay a bit more for my produce, but the quality is significantly better. I know that I'm immediate, like having a direct impact on the impact on the life of somebody because it's their life, their right. business, their livelihood, and I'm supporting local business and I'm eating a lot more seasonally. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about why we, you know, why we should be eating seasonally and what the, you know, what happens in each of the seasons and what we should be looking for in that food. Well, sort of touched on that before, but for example, now that we're here in, in summer at long, long last here, we've been eating soups until two weeks ago, <laughs> but um, truthfully, this is the time where we are more outward. We, um, because it's warmer outside, we do not need to warm from the inside. Um, and it's a time for us to help our bodies cool. Um, so by eating more raw foods, more fruit and veg. Um, also, our, our metabolisms uh, aren't as sluggish in the summer. So we don't need that, that grounding slower foods um, so you need to eat lighter in the summer and and that's when all the beautiful local produce is out when we get into the winter time and the fall that's when you know yes more squashes more soups more grains more not that you can't eat that way in the summer but um, certainly our bodies don't require as much support in the summer and spring as we and it's more of a detoxifying time it's time for the bodies to sort of purge all that winterness and um, and then we need to get back to that grounding food to help bring our immune systems back to a place where we can fight all the bacteria and all the um, colds and flus that are coming. So we won't talk about the months but we'll talk about the seasons yes. because the months are different depending on whether right. we're in the north or the south, southern hemispheres and right. in Australia right now it's the middle of winter and I'm so happy to have escaped for an entire month. I love the summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving being warm. Um, so let's think about summer food because that's what we're experiencing right now. What are the yep. types of foods that you should expect to see that are seasonal? Because I think for many people because we see this food day in, day out, year in, year out in our supermarket, we can forget, it can be hard to know, is it actually in season now? Right. Because we see it right. on the shelves all the time. Absolutely. Well, here in Vancouver, we've had a much slower start to our season because our, our winter really wanted to hang on. <laughs> um, so right now uh, in July, we should be expecting to see the start of our stone fruit which would be uh, cherries is the first. I just got an exciting word from our biodynamic farmer today that we should be expecting to see our biodynamic cherries in just a week or so. Um, but that the cold weather in June really pushed our season back. Blueberries are coming very soon. Um, we're into local strawberries right now. So we're seeing a lot of our berries. Um, in terms of um, veg, we should be seeing salad greens, um, some cabbages are, are almost ready, but it's really been quite slow. So we're seeing more kales, more lettuces, um, and then fruit berries, that kind of thing. But as the summer progresses, we'll start seeing our carrots, our potatoes, um, and uh, the squash by the end of the summer. One of the things I love about summer, it, it is always sad when you're on a SIBO diet because mm -hmm. you can't have a lot of these things are the stone fruits. Right. I love them. But yeah. for people following a SIBO diet, generally they're off limits for a period of time. The sugar. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but all the berries, and I think berries are, are really wonderful, um, mm -hmm. generally low fructose uh, mm -hmm. load for someone. They're quite low in sugar as well. So right. they're a really great um, fruit uh, for people dealing with, you know, a bacterial overgrowth. 
Yes, absolutely. And anyone who's got sugar concerns, I mean, that's a huge thing today where we're all trying to reduce our sugar. And uh, berries are one that are always allowed on a low sugar diet. So it's nice. You can have them as breakfast. You can add them to your oats. You can make them in smoothies or you can just enjoy them on their own. And they're just a great snack. Someone um, was talking about the impact of sugar on the body that I was listening to some time ago and they talked about how sugar versus say a fruit is seen so differently by our bodies Mm -hmm. and that when it comes as a little package size it's nature's you know fast food piece of fruit Mm -hmm. that the body knows what to do with it even though it's got fructose in it and and there's many people with a fructose issue but there's fiber and there's cellulose and there's all sorts of stuff that the mm-hmm. body goes, I know what this is. This is a strawberry and I know what to do with a strawberry yeah. versus highly processed sugar that is just an immediate blood sugar spike. That's right. Um, fructose on its own, not so great. But when it's in nature's perfect package, it's all of those things. Our body can break it down. It buffers it so that the sugar acts very differently in our bodies. Um, than when we're eating it as an isolate or as an additive in another product. So yeah, it's absolutely, sugars in and of themselves are totally natural. It's just when we start putting them in all sorts of places that they don't belong um, and isolating them, it's a real problem. Hey guys, I hope you've been enjoying today's episode. I wanted to let you know that it has been brought to you by the SIBO cookbooks. I'm so excited to have this series of cookbooks that are now available to help you on your journey, making cooking for SIBO so much easier and giving you inspiration in the kitchen. Just because we're eating for a special diet doesn't mean it needs to be restricted. The good news is the cookbooks are now available both in Australia and North America. So if you've been wanting to get your hands on an edition that uses Fahrenheit and pounds and ounces and that you're seeing recipes and ingredients using words that you recognize and love, then make sure you head to breathtests.com to grab your copy of the North American edition of the SIBO cookbooks. They are dispatched for American and Canadian customers locally, so you only need to pay postage from a local level. And for those of you in Australia or the rest of the world, make sure you head to thehealthygut.co where you can grab your copy of the Australian cookbook. Now let's get back to the show. So we've talked about the kind of produce that you can expect to see in summer. What about as we move into autumn or fall, as it's known in North America? North America. (laughs) So in the fall, we see more of our squashes, our potatoes, um, cabbages hold, carrots hold. um, But really, we start uh, getting into some of our root veg, like rutabaga, turnips, um, what is it called? As sun chokes or summer and fall, but um, also celery root, those sorts of things. And they're, they're more for soups, for roasts. Um, yeah, we see way more of that. We still do see um, some lettuces, but that sort of phases out. And then as we move into winter, what are the types of vegetables you can expect or even fruits we haven't covered much in no. terms of fruits well back to fall then for fruits we get a lot of our local apples which are wonderful and um, we're so fortunate that our storing methods are so good now that we can enjoy local bc apples well into spring um, but they're best fresh um, so yes we do have some fruit um, but it, not as much because we're in the northern hemisphere. We don't have as much in the fall that we can, other than pears and apples. Um, the root vegetables are the best. Um, they are they are harvested in the fall, but because they're root vegetables, they store so beautifully, and we eat those through the winter here. I really like roasting root vegetables mm-hmm. with a little bit of ghee or olive oil and salt and pepper. Mm-hmm. And when you come off sugar, it's amazing how sweet you can take like the sweetness you can taste in food. And I know that for me, when I started roasting some root vegetables, you know, I could tolerate parsnip and I could always eat carrots, those types of things and roast them up and have them with some fish Mm -hmm. or some meat. And they would just be like these little 
gorgeous, sweet (laughs) things. And I thought, I've never tasted how sweet they were before. It opens up your palate. Your taste buds become alive, really. But carrots in and of themselves are so sweet. When you roast them, they're delicious. So yeah, it is nice because your, your mouth comes alive and you can taste real food again and enjoy it. I've got uh, a couple of roast vegetable dishes in my um, SIBO Family Favourites cookbook and I love Mm -hmm. roast carrots with a little bit of thyme, so Mm -hmm. fresh thyme sprinkled on them, salt and pepper and ghee or butter if you can tolerate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Delicious. (laughs) And if you can, like just sometimes just the teeniest, tiniest little bit of – I use a raw organic local honey, Mm -hmm. like literally half a teaspoon I'll put in it and it just – adds this lovely complexity they are my favorite way to eat carrots delicious i do one with uh, fennel seeds Mm. which is lovely too Mm. i'll have to try yours yeah (laughs) so we've gone through winter and winter is you know it's it's well it's not as cold in melbourne as it is here in vancouver (laughs) especially this year (laughs) yeah yeah, i've been as i've been uh, traveling around both uh, the states and now here Particularly the West Coast seems to have been hit with some pretty yeah. vile winter weather yeah. by the sounds of things. It was intense. Yeah. Quite cold here. We got a lot of snow. And it really stuck around where we had cold spring rains where we would have expected to see some early spring veg. Um, usually I get calls from my farms right away, but the calls from my farms are no. We're going to be really late this year. But it's hard on the body, too, because we saw a lot of people come into the shop and they were experiencing, you know, winter ailments. Um, And, you know, I think our bodies were really confused. Like, it's supposed to be spring now. And like, why am I eating this? We all needed those, you know, that time for the greens and and just the lightening of our immune systems. But no, we didn't see that. (laughs) So coming back then through, we've gone through winter and we're coming into spring. What are the types of fruits and veg that we can Mm -hmm. see at that time of year? So again, locally, we don't see many fruits, but we get um, some beautiful fruits from California, which isn't too far off. Um, And we'll see, um, you know, gorgeous grapes and and. we tend we do tend to start going down south further afield so chile and new zealand sometimes for our apples and pears Um, but it's spring is really uh it's about greens it's about detox so lots of good early baby mixes of kales and um, shards and and uh, lettuces which are perfect and but really we're in vancouver in particular we don't see a lot locally we're still sort of coming out of that winter phase but mostly greens what is there anything that we you just talked about the baby greens Mm -hmm. like the young or the baby versions of things are Mm -hmm. they any better than the full-grown varieties not necessarily the flavors are different um but certainly they have um energetically you find that that when they're younger there is more energy to them. So there will be some additional nutrients like microgreens as well and sprouts, which are wonderful for us. Um, But um, yeah, I mean, you do get a bit of a boost. So someone's thinking, they're listening to this podcast and they're thinking, I feel like I need to incorporate more organic food into my diet. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's really made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Would you, do you advise that people start with certain produce over others when they're just commencing? Well, certainly choosing organic is quite cost prohibitive for a lot of people. So what I always recommend is look to the Dirty Dozen. You familiar with that in Australia too? So the Dirty Dozen is really the big hitters. So you want the thin skinned um, produce like grapes, absolutely. Um, Berries, you want to look at those number one. But I'd also say it's really important for your meats and your dairies if you are um, able to consume them and tolerate them. That is probably, um, you know, right up there because when you're dealing with animals, you know, they um, it can be generations of toxins that are built up in them. So it's really critical that you look at at the dairy and the meats. Um, But certainly the dirty dozen is the most important. And I'll have that link on my on the show notes for mm-hmm. the Dirty Dozen. Mm-hmm. Um, why? What is happening to our animals in terms of you know the quality or the lack thereof of the produce if we're not eating organic? Like what? Yeah. 
what's happening to them? Because surely they're just, you know, out there and, you know, eating the food they're supposed to, or is that not the case? That is not the case, unfortunately. Even um, with some certified organic meats, um, the challenge there is that um, they become what is known as feedlot. So these animals are all living together. They're being fed grains. Oftentimes the grains are GMO'd um, or they're, they're eating grains that they don't tolerate very well. So a lot of these poor cows, they have seven stomachs and they're not eating the grass they need to be eating and they, and they need to go through this whole digestive process and they're not. So they're really unhealthy internally and so the un, the more unhealthy they become the more antibiotics they're fed and uh, and so now you've got you've got that as a, a negative cycle as well um, when you're dealing with pasture raised um, meats they're out they're eating the food they were intended to eat they're eating grass they're eating bugs um, they're a healthier animal because their digestion is not compromised and therefore you're eating a more nutritious product I always think of the poor little cows. Like it's hard enough for us with, with one, one stomach, stomach and yeah. one <laughs> digestive tract. And, you, you know, all of us SIBOers know how painful that is to then think the poor cows, <laughs> seven, seven stomachs. To, <laughs> and can oh. you imagine if you're not eating what you're meant to be eating, seven. Oh. I know. <laughs> Something that I've done um, over these last couple of years is that I have sought out good quality butchers or good quality farmers. Mm -hmm. um, my personal experience is if a farmer is who they say they are, they'll actually welcome you to the farm. Absolutely. Because they want to show you that they really are a quality producer. Mm -hmm. And so I've contacted farmers and said, you know, we went to the pig farm and uh, we've been to other pig farms, we've been to chicken farms. Uh, my partner and I go on these kind of fun um, day trips where we just go off and go see farms but yeah. they're tro they're totally transparent yeah and and so I think you know if you're looking at brands or producers and you're thinking I'd like to know more about them contact them because Absolutely. if they really are who they are then they'll yeah. be very happy to answer your questions about yeah. how they work and how they raise their animals and and welcoming you to their facility absolutely and most of them can't wait to welcome you they're proud of the work they do they work so hard um and absolutely our our farmer for example our beef farmer joyce and john holmes they're up in empire valley which is near williams lake and they've we've been we've had a relationship with them for nine years and they used to have a guest house on site um, you can still go up and visit them anytime you like but they used to welcome people on to the farm to stay extended periods of time and uh, you know really get to know the animals yeah it's it's quite extraordinary to do that well like I was saying before with the pig farm that I visited I just loved you know we camped in the paddocks the pigs were um, kind of fenced off um, not very far from us, but at least they weren't in the tents with us. Yeah. Although I would have quite happily had the pigs in there because they were so gorgeous. But what was lovely is, you know, we went to sleep with the sound of the pigs snuffling. And then in the morning when they saw us getting up, they all came running to the fence, like hundreds and really? hundreds of pigs coming to say good morning. <laughs> and they're all snuffling and snorting and making noises and sniffing our hands and giving us little kisses. Wow. And I'm like, I love these pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know that I feel like eating them. No, exactly. <laughs> it does kind of make you. <laughs> but what I re really respected um, about this farm was that she was so proud of her animals. Mm -hmm. And one of my big things is as a meat eater, having been vegetarian for seven years, mm -hmm. I really am very conscious of the fact that I take a life every time I eat meat. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be eating meat from a producer that really respects the life of the animal and yeah. uses the entire animal, not just the best cuts. Absolutely. And when we did the butchering um, class with her, which was amazing, there was virtually nothing that went to waste, yeah. like maybe a few tiny bits and pieces here and there, mm -hmm. but everything from head to tail mm -hmm. was used. Mm -hmm. And that to me showed respect for the life of her animal. And she was like, I don't want this animal to die in vain. I want this animal to have lived a really great, healthy, happy life. Absolutely. Um, what I also loved about this farmer was that she takes her pigs to the slaughterhouse herself. Mm -hmm. She loads them on the trailer. She unloads them. They go straight in. She's like, I don't want my pigs to see any other pigs. Yeah. I don't want my pigs to see um, pigs that have been in pens because she said they're crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, my pigs, I want to have the happy 
the healthiest and happiest existence till the to last the moment. Yeah. And I was like, you, like she doesn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. She can get somebody else to do that. But mm -hmm. that's how much she loves her pigs. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> you go, you good thing. That is tremendous. And I think back to the, the top to tail, I mean, that is sustainable in so many levels. There's so much food waste in this world. So I, I just think that that's an amazing thing. I wish I knew this farmer <laughs> too yeah, far no. away from us. But. Yes. <laughs> um, if we think about, uh, so like I said, someone's thinking about changing. They're, they're coming into a store and they're looking mm -hmm. at all of the labels mm -hmm. and they're thinking, well, well, how do I know that this is real? Mm -hmm. Are there particular labels that people should look for on their food or their packages yeah. that really does mean it is truly organic? Yes. So in North America, we have um, the USDA, which is the American standard. We also have the Canadian um, Organic Association here and our... Uh, our testing and our rules in Canada are actually quite a bit more strict than the American ones. But it is important to look for that certification. That's the certification uh, guidelines that they work towards, that all the producers have paid for, and it gives you that level of comfort. Um, if you're looking at packaged foods, for example, anything that's certified organic has to be 97% organic in North America. And that's all the ingredients in it. Um, there are, um, for, for produce, it's 100% organic by getting that certification. And all of the numbers on organic tags, those stickers that you see on your apples, they'll start with a nine if they're organic. Um, which is a good a good hint because most numbers will start with a five or a four, I believe. Um, but organic, certified organic produce will always start with a nine. Is there anything that people should look out for? What, are there any sort of tricks that marketers will have done to make their food appear yes, the green to be washed. more organic than what it really is? So the number one, which is very important, is, of course, the non-GMO project certified, which is very important. And I think I'm so glad to see the right to know, the label is out there. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't grown without pesticides or herbicides. So the number one thing you should look for is certified organic. Um, and then in terms of um, grocery stores, when you're in there, if it's a grocery store that sells both certified and non-certified, be really careful and you're going to have to read the tags and read the labels. It's very easy to pick the wrong one. There are several very big, large multinational chains that do that. And you know, you pay a premium for non-organic food. You don't even realize that you've picked the wrong one because they're sitting next to each other. It's all very tricky to go. <laughs> it is, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. It shouldn't yeah. be like that. And us as consumers need to, unfortunately, we have to be very educated ourselves. Mm -hmm. We really need to be our own private investigators and we need to take control of our own health and our own um, yeah. nutritional input because we can't, sadly, trust no. the producers or the supermarkets That's right. in, uh, in what they say, what, what pretty pictures they put on their packaging. Unfortunately, it's true. We have to be our own advocate in in all in all aspects but the more you know the better armed you are and you can make the right choices and my piece of advice and i'm going to ask you for yours is start small you don't have to change everything no. overnight you can just pick one type of produce that you want to start with and it might be that you go i'm just going to start with the dirty dozen yeah or just start eating those things organically and then i'll start moving from there and I think that for me, once I started going organic, the flavor was so much nicer that when I, you know, mm -hmm. on occasion I have to go and buy, you know, let's say all the shops are closed, my normal markets are closed and I have to swing past a supermarket, which is so rare, but it happens. And it just doesn't taste nearly as good. No. And I think that I'd rather have not eaten this. Yeah. It's, that's the best deterrent, truthfully. Once you um, move to organic foods, you do, you, it tastes better. It tastes like real food. Um, that That is my advice as well, Rebecca. I always say start with a dirty dozen. Making lifestyle changes that are sustainable, you can't do them all at once because you will fail. It's just too overwhelming, um, especially if you have a condition like SIBO because you made enough changes, which are quite 
tremendous. So absolutely the dirty dozen and then meats and dairies. Um, and then, and then you'll find that, you know, you, you start buying smaller amounts, you don't have as much food waste. So really the cost becomes comparable. We've had a great show um, airing in Australia in recent times called The War on Waste, and I know that there's been one in the UK. I don't know if it's if the same kind of shows come to the to Canada and the US, mm. but what I found fascinating was it just highlighted just how much is being thrown away. And my partner and I, um, you know, we're very, very conscious of the impact we have personally on this planet, right. and we have a worm farm, so our worms oh. take all of our... Um, vegetable and fruit waste other than citrus and onion and garlic which we can eat again mm -hmm. uh, and I love the fact that it's this wonderful little cycle and we're in a re really pretty small apartment in uh, inner city Melbourne we don't have a garden but we have our worm farm which produces this kind of elixir that mm -hmm. plants love we have um, pots all over our balcony at home and my partner has um, pots at his work at his work balcony and we're growing all sorts of things whatever we can grow in such a small confined space and then we're eating it and it has no pesticides or herbicides and we've grown it with our own amazing well, we he <laughs> has grown with his own hands and it's a really lovely little cycle of yeah. you know taking as little as we can from the planet in our own very small way. Yeah. But I'm sure over a lifetime, the amount of waste that we're avoiding by doing that yeah. is enormous. That's so inspiring. We could all strive to do more of that. Um, but absolutely, even in a small space, look at what you're able to do. And I know that here there's a big movement towards that as well. And people are becoming more and more educated. But the, the amount of food that's wasted daily is shocking. Um, we did have a few documentaries here. Um, they are not on the top of my head at the moment, but um, not a, a full program, but it's, it's incredible and it, it's shameful to see the ways we have. Here at um, Sprout, we're really conscious of that. We donate, we have a, a daycare next door. So when things are, you know, just approaching, not even expiry because things are moving more towards best before dates. So obviously they're, they're fine to be consumed. We'll donate it to the kids. Um, when we look at our produce, we donate to a couple of food programs here in uh, the lower mainland. We also consume them ourselves because you can cook this stuff. It doesn't need to look perfect, right? We need to move away from the perfect food. And is that something with organic produce that it does look a little less perfect, do you find? Or yep. it can be pretty gnarly sometimes. And sometimes that, that imperfection is so cool, you know, when you get the two legged carrots and, and that kind of thing. And that's not that's not so much. It's just that, you know, when things are grown and, and for some people that's that means it was in the dirt. So sometimes we'll have dirty lettuce and um, yeah, and things will be dented and bruised, but it doesn't not necessarily bruised, but they might they might just not be grown to be the like the perfect apple, and that's okay. It still tastes delicious and nutritious. Well, it's more than okay. It's how nature intends it, it and absolutely. it's just that we've been conditioned, and our supermarkets have had yeah. enormous influence on our growers on what it, the produce must look like. And sadly, all of those poor little apples and bananas and oh, carrots and yeah. everything that don't look perfect chucked they get binned they get binned. and it just breaks my heart so we've all we all can do our own little part so much um by supporting local business local growers yes eating organic where possible mm -hmm. which in turn helps our little microorganism world That's living within right. us and ultimately helps with our SIBO. 100%. So, Nicole, thank you so much for coming thank on to you. the Healthy Gut Podcast live edition <laughs> here in North Vancouver. And thanks to everybody that um, came along yes. today to watch it. It's just so gorgeous to see everybody and I have loved it so much. So yes, thanks thank for coming you. on the show. And thank you for coming to Sprout and checking us out. My pleasure. Um, if people would like to make contact with you, mm -hmm. how can they um, do so? So you can reach us by email at info at sproutmarket.ca. You can also visit our website, which is sproutmarket.ca, um, or you can call us, and we're at area code 604-983-6657. And that's a plus one in the front plus for anyone one, that's, that's right. outside of North America. <laughs> we do have a very large listener base from all around the world. It's very exciting. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca. 
I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Nicole Robbins. If you'd like to connect with Nicole or get the show notes from today's episode, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash going organic. I love hearing from you. So if you would love to make a recommendation or a suggestion on a topic for a future podcast, The Healthy Gut, or if you have a guest you would love me to interview for you, simply drop me a line at info at thehealthygut.co. And don't forget to leave a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. It really does help others know that this is the right podcast for them to listen to when it comes to learning about gut health and SIBO. And come say hi to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest and Google+. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. Coming up on next week's show, we're joined by Cara Little and she talks to us about going low tox or reducing the toxic exposure that we all commonly have in our households. Following on from today's episode with Nicole, this was another area that I started to work on as I progressed through my SIBO treatment. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you guys next week when we talk all about those hidden chemicals that seep into our lives, in our homes and in our products. So I'll see you next week with Cara Little. You've been listening to The Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about The Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.